the former president has been acquitted, but the evidence brought forward by the nine impeachment managers is still being analyzed in the court of public opinion. Stacey Plaskett was one of those lawyers. The, de the delegate from the U.S. Virgin Islands stood out during the trial making a bold case against Trump, and here she takes on Michelle Martin behind the scenes of that tumultuous event. Thanks, Christian. Delegate Plaskett, thank you so much for speaking with us. As we are speaking now, it's under two months ago that people you know, there was a mob attack on your place of work. Right. And, you know, now it has become clear that had any of you actually been located by some of the people in the mob, you could have been killed. And, right. you know, not a couple of weeks after that, you're heading up, you know, an impeachment inquiry. Why do you think your presentation stood out to so many? I mean, as evidenced by the fact that you've been, you know, highly sought after since the since the proceedings concluded, you've been highly sought after. And I just wonder, why do you think it is that your presentation stood out so much? I, I'm, I'm not sure, um, you know, because everyone was so skilled. All of, among the nine of us, uh, we in, encompass over a hundred years of law practice. I um, am the only person on the team who actually, as we used to say, spoke Republican. Uh, because I had been in a Republican administration. And so I really directed um, my arguments, as well as all of us, to trying to um, speak to all 100 senators, but also really trying to speak to those Republicans to try and bring them over to our side. And so that was really um, a mind frame that I had when I was speaking, really trying to be very precise um, surgical in the execution of the evidence that we had that was going to bring it out to light, not only for those senators, but illuminate it for the American public in a way that it would not be forgotten in history. I was wondering what it was like for you when you're seeing this video and you're seeing how close the attackers actually came to, to, to the floor, to, to getting access to the members physically. Right. You know, that was the first time a lot of people had understood that or seen right. that. And right. I was wondering what it was like for you when you saw that for the first time. Well, I think for all of the managers, we were really struck by how close we came, but for the grace of God and the tremendous bravery of Capitol Police and other law enforcement on that day who were incredibly outnumbered and were actually engaged for, you know, you're talking three, four hours in hand-to-hand -hand combat, almost medieval-style combat, um, to keep individuals out. Um, and there were times in preparation that different managers um, kind of broke down um, thinking about this. Uh, for me, I talked on the floor of the Senate about how looking at some of that evidence really reminded me uh, the juxtaposition of those Americans storming the Capitol to those Americans on flight 93, mm -hmm. 93 um, who gave those 44 Americans who gave their lives to ensure that no one could breach the Capitol, um, that our democracy, even its symbol would not be destroyed. Um, that was very, that was very traumatic for me as well. Thank you. It's my understanding just from the reporting of, of uh, folks who were in the gallery that when the, testimony touched on the lawmakers being in danger, that the senators were very uh, attentive. It's yeah. my understanding from the reporting that when other testimony was brought in about the other people and how they were affected, congressional staff, the support staff, the janitorial staff, the law enforcement, that they were not so attentive. There were lots of empty seats, uh, is my understanding. And I just have to ask, is that true since you were hmm. there? And how did that uh, strike you, that they didn't um, seem to be as uh, focused on that? I don't know if that's entirely true. I think throughout the portions of myself, um, Eric Swalwell, um, Dave Cicilline, Joaquin Castro, that section in there, um, senators were very attentive. Uh, I can recall senators in the Republican side shaking their head in disgust, um, some welling up with tears during those portions. Uh, I wasn't speaking about the threat to us as individuals. Mm -hmm. I saw them doing that during my presentation. Um, and shockingly, though, these are the same senators who did not vote to convict the president.
was very telling as well. Hmm. Well, what, what does that tell you? What, what does that tell you? Um, I had the sense afterwards, I mean, I had Republican senators speaking with me um, in between presentations that we were doing a tremendous job, that we were mm-hmm. outlining the facts completely. Uh, had a senator, a Republican senator, tell me that he believed we made our case, but he was not going to vote uh, mm-hmm. to pick the president. Um, you know, some of them were relying on the uh, justification that they could not, they did not feel that they could um, indict uh, or convict a former president, and, but not looking me in the eye when they were saying that. Well, first of all, that, 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 I mean, that, that, that matter had been disposed of. I mean, that was the first vote to determine. And as, as, this is not a criminal matter. Let's just be clear. I think most people should know that by now. It's a political trial. The Senate sets its own rules. But the Senate leadership, then led by Mitch McConnell, made the decision to only entertain the article of impeachment after the president had left, the former president had exactly. left. They determined that timing. Exactly. And it was a vote on whether or not on the constitutionality. That was the first vote. Exactly. So, so in essence, they were engaging in jury nullification. That's a great way of putting it. They had made a determination that they were not going to convict the president. Um, and it didn't matter how much evidence we were going to put in front of them. You know, I heard so many people, um, Democrats who I know have a lot of hurt feelings and angst and um, are frustrated by the process, wanting us to bring multiple witnesses. Well, you know, if you think back and really look at the evidence that we presented, it was overwhelming. Um, We did have uh, witnesses, police officers speaking uh, about their experience and what it meant to them we were able to get in the statement of our brave, uh, patriotic uh, colleague, Jamie Herrera Butler, as to what Kevin McCarthy told us. Um, Individuals need to also be aware that people do not come on the well of the floor of the Senate, raise their hand and give testimony in the same way we do in our courts. This would have been a deposition. All the senators would have seen would be videotapes. And we recalled that we're still in court battling over the uh, subpoena and request for testimony from Don McCann from the first investigation of the president that was the first impeachment. And so it wasn't evidence, more evidence, more witnesses that we needed. These senators had put in their mind what they were going to do. And I think we were, um, you know, it's heartbreaking not to have won. It's heartbreaking not to have shown not only the conviction, but the disqualification of President Donald Trump. But um, we take heart in the notion that one, this is the most bipartisan vote to convict uh, or a, a president in American history. It is the one with the most majority of members of the Senate voted to convict. That has not happened in the past previously. And also, American history, all Americans in the world saw Donald Trump for who he was, how he recognized, encouraged, and brought to himself violence, um, internalized it and utilized it for himself, massaged it and inflamed it, and then directed it at the Capitol to try and stop the certification of a presidential election, to attempt to assassinate his own vice president Um, the first in line to the presidency, um, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, the second in line to the presidency, uh, and all for his own personal power and gain. And I think that will disqualify him to the American voter, it's my belief, um, for the rest of his purported or uh, attempted political life. I know, I know that you've been asked a, quite a bit uh, in the days since the matter was concluded about the whole question of witnesses, and you just you know, told us that the result would have been the result that was achieved anyway, which was statements delivered on the floor and entered into the record. That's the way it works. So you've made that case several times over the last couple of days because you've been asked about it repeatedly. But was there some sort of an agreement or tacit agreement with the White House that you would conclude this matter expeditiously so that you could move on to other, other business? Did that happen? I don't know if that happening. I was not privy to any conversation like that. We were given a green light by Speaker Pelosi that she trusts 
the team. Um, she assembled a team that she believed was more than capable. Uh, when we go over to the Senate, we're going, you know, she did the negotiation with Senator Schumer, but that we were, um, decision-making was ours. And as you've heard Jamie Raskin say, the decision was his. We believed at the end of our presentation, before the defense counsel went on, that we were done, that we had presented a case. And it was not our intention to call witnesses. We had the information about Jamie Herrera Butler. We felt we had an obligation to try and get that statement in on that Friday night. And thus you saw the negotiations that were going on on Saturday morning, uh, first to call her as a witness to try and open up the ability to then put that statement in the record. Uh, having been able to do that, we felt that we had done our job more than adequately um, beyond or even at the criminal, uh, the criminal level of expectation of beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Senate was not going to follow um, follow the- well, with, 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 with one may of thinking everybody there was a witness, I mean, Right. Well, they were not only you could argue that they were all witnesses. But right? let me ask, ask you this. But they did weren't just witnesses. They were all victims, right? Right. Did you did you honestly think going into this that you could achieve a conviction? Oh, uh, absolutely. I don't enter any fight without thinking I'm going to win uh, or else you're not going to give your all. And so I think all of us, all of us, you know, when people would say, oh, who are the 17 that you're going after? We're going over after 100 um, senators. It was our intention to speak to all of the senators to try and um, muster up in them the courage and their duty to their country, along with the full force of the evidence of that uh, attempted coup of our government on January 6th to get them to convict and then to disqualify, disqualify Donald Trump. What did you think when you heard Mitch McConnell after the matter was concluded and he gave this speech on the floor, this very forceful indictment of the president's conduct? He, he basically made your case. He said that the president, the former president, was for all intents and purposes morally and practically responsible. That was your case. So what went through your mind when he was giving that speech? Uh, I felt it was disingenuous. I thought it showed um, his complete lack of uh, honor. I was enraged. I thought that it was the height of hypocrisy. And I thought that he, this is a man who is more interested in personal gain and power and attempting to remain the m minority leader and potentially the majority leader than he is in the future of our country. Because it's not only about convicting Donald Trump, it's about sending a message that our country will not stand for individuals who betray their oath of office, who attempt to um, disturb the peaceful transfer of power for their personal gain. It's about what the founders of this nation, who the Republicans believe so wholeheartedly in, um, would have wanted us to do. You served in the Justice Department as a political appointee in a Republican administration, the administration of George W. Bush. Do you mind if I ask, were you a registered Republican at that time? Yes, I was. You were. You were. So what? What? Uh, why did you register as a Republican at that time? Why did you choose the Republican Party? What made you change? What made you leave it at that time? That well, well preceded these events. Um, well, you know, I am, am a follower. You know, I recall when I was asked, um, by the White House in applying for the political appointee position, what type of Republican was I? You know, was I a Rockefeller Republican or, you know, what type? And I said I was a Malcolm X Republican. <laughs> um, that I believed in, you know, in small business. I believed in entrepreneurship. I believed in the power of education. Um, I believed in the power of state government uh, and what it can do for individuals. Um, I believe, you know, in those type of values. And the individuals that I worked with, listen, I worked with Robert Mueller. Um, you know, Chris Ray was the chief of staff on the team that I worked with, with Larry Thompson. Um, you know, I recall Larry Thompson um, arguing with the White House about the um, 
University of Michigan case uh, on affirmative action during that time. And there was dialogue and back and forth and negotiation, which allowed uh, the, the White House to take a position that did in some way support affirmative action. Uh, I was placed in charge of the RICO case going after the tobacco companies. Those were the type of Republicans that I worked with at that time. And I left the Republican Party because I saw the party moving away from that. I went back to the party that I believed um, would allow exchanges. You know, I'm considered a moderate Democrat because the Democrats allow um, free thought and, and differences of opinions to be a part of the party. What about the former president? What, what should happen next? I mean, do you think the Justice Department should pursue available charges? Yeah, I, well, you know, I do not pretend to... Um, or I don't think it would be appropriate for me to say what the Justice Department should or should not do, what they should or should not um, proceed in. I, I believe that they will look very carefully at criminal charges, at civil rights charges. You know, I look at individuals who've been nominated. Uh, my, I think Kristen Clark, um, who has been nominated to be the head of the Civil Rights Division, is one of the most brilliant uh, young Black women lawyers of our time. I'm sure individuals like her, Tisha James in New York, um, the Attorney General and Fulton County's um, Attorney General, as well as the District of Columbia, just looking at incitement to violence, will um, take deliberate, will deliberate on it um, with full measure and whatever decisions they come up with, uh, you know, I'm sure they will have our full support. There is that question of at, at what point do you pursue these charges and it, what what is the benefit and what is the cost? I mean, now you know that you've lived through this and you heard all the arguments. What, what do you think about that? Um, you know, I've been asked this question before, and my response is is that I think we're at the same place in our country. Uh, with you know, history repeats itself, and we're at the same place we were immediately after the Civil War. Mm -hmm where legislators had to make a decision, what do we do about seditionists and traitors, individuals who attempted to cede themselves from the union? Uh, and the decision there was made to, you know, let's shake like gentlemen and let them go back. And these individuals and their soldiers and those with them went back to the South and began to terrorize um, African-Americans and others, continue to utilize the you know, the 19th Amendment to, and, and well, I'm sorry, the 13th Amendment to build their own wealth, right? Um, utilizing Black people in chain gangs um, to do what needed to be done to grow their economy. There was no reckoning. There was no accountability. Um, and so I'm concerned that should we not engage in an appropriate reckoning in this instance, the mm -hmm. embolden those individuals. Do I care that they feel put out and they feel defensive, I could care less uh, that they feel defensive. What they have to be is accountable for their actions and for those things that fly in the face of American values and American law. Delegate Stacey Plasky, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you.